hey, it's 2 o'clock. And uh, for funsies, they decided that they were going to make all these talks 20 minutes back to back with literally no break in between. And for that reason, one, I'm going to talk like this the entire time uh, because we prepared a 40 minute talk. And so it's going to be really awkward. Uh, but that's what I'm, I'm kidding. I'm not going to do that. That's awful. Um, but so, so for one, um, we are going to start right this very second uh, because we know that we're going to get kicked off the stage at exactly 2.20. Um, and we do have lots of things to say. And also when we are together, we tend to like go off on these crazy tangents, which we're going to try really hard not to do today. Um, so hi, I'm Rebecca. And I'm Waldo. And that's all he's actually allowed to say for this entire talk. Yep. Um, but I'm kidding. That's not entirely true. Um, so one of the things that if we had a 40 minute talk we would do is give you a long, rich history of each of our careers and exactly how we got to this moment in time. Um, but instead, we're actually very deliberately focusing on the two years that we worked together at this place uh, from 2021 to 2023. Um, so Shadow's Edge Software is um, the name, the, one of the names for the 90th Cyberspace Operations Squadron, uh, which is the coolest Earmuffs for my new coworkers, which is the coolest place to work on the planet um, because their mission is one of the most incredibly cool missions that I can possibly imagine, uh, which is basically to build malware uh, to use against our adversaries. There aren't a lot of missions that cool. There are not a lot of missions that cool that don't get you put in jail. Um, and it made for a really fun and exciting place to work and a really fun but still somehow difficult place to recruit and retain hackers, which is what we're going to talk about today. Um, so. That's a little bit about me and Shadow's Edge. Uh, what I'm going to talk about right now for our intro is the thing that I'm most proud of that we accomplished in those two years. Uh, and for me, that is uh, advocating for some changes in the position coding of our civilians that led to all of our technical civilians getting 30 to 50% pay raises, uh, which was awesome. So I am most proud of that, and I will turn it over to you. Yeah, so Casey Miller, I go by Waldo. Um, been in the, the Air Force for 18 years. Um, as Rebecca said, today we're just really going to talk about that two, two and a half year time span uh, at Shadow's Edge. Um, the, uh, she, she mentioned what she was most proud of. Uh, I'm going to share my biggest frustration and probably disappointment from the two years there, uh, which was our attrition rate for our military folks. Right. So the, the squadron is about 240 people. Uh, about 100 of those are software developers. About half of those, so around 50-ish, are military. Uh, our attrition rate of our military folks was 86%. Now, the caveat to that um, is that 86% that of them left the government when their time at the 90th was done because they fell in love with the mission and the people and they, and they found like, this is what I wanna do, this is where I provide the most value. Um, and Big Air Force said, sorry, like we have other plans for you and it doesn't involve you continuing to do this type of technical work. Um, and so, the, uh, so for me, not being able to crack that code in the, in the two years that I was there as the commander uh, is, is my biggest, uh, one of my biggest, uh, frustrations and one thing that I'm continuing to work uh, as we move forward and one of the things we'll discuss as part of our presentation. Uh, we do have a couple goals um, I want to highlight again because we're so, so crunched on time. Um, for folks who have never worked with the DoD before, um, my hope is by the time we get to the end of this conversation uh, that you will be interested or curious or excited uh, about the potential to work with the government in whatever way uh, works for you, right? Whether that be uh, in the military, as a civilian, as a government contractor, but at the end of the day, having that tie back to the incredible purpose uh, for why we exist and what we do uh, is, uh, is what I'm hoping for. If you're already in the government uh, or working with the government, uh, what I hope will achieve is giving you some hope in terms of what we see, uh, what we've seen change over the last few years in this space, and what we are seeing in terms of movement uh, across the government uh, that we believe is, uh, is going to really change how we see this space and how we can effectively work in this space uh, moving forward. All right, so we've got our, uh, you know, gen, uh, AI generated artwork here to, to talk about why we need hackers. I drew um, that myself. She did, yeah, by hand. Um, so the, uh, one of the changes we've seen researched and written about uh, quite a bit over the last couple of years is a shift towards software defined warfare. Um, there's been, I've heard it referenced a few times in the, in the uh, open GovCon uh, conversations today, um, but that really is marking a pivot in terms of how we see not only warfare in this space, but especially the ability of people to influence warfare in this space. Um, the only way to be successful in software-defined warfare uh, is to have folks who are comfortable with software. And I'd go, I'd go so far to say not even just comfortable, but live in it. Um, and that's not how the DOD is structured today. Um, companies, for example, do not contract out um, 
their uh, their IP, right? Like their um, intellectual property is something that they will design in house, uh, that they will protect, uh, because it's ultimately what, what's going to generate their profits. Um, the government since World War II uh, has been organized in such a way where we define a requirement, uh, we let that requirement out, we have somebody else build a solution that meets that requirement and then deliver it back to us. Um, and, uh, and as a result, currently, if you look at some companies that we would not traditionally think of as software companies like Domino's or John Deere uh, or Home Depot, um, they currently employ more software developers than the US Air Force does, which is really scary, right? Um, so as we look to make that pivot, uh, we're, we're focusing more and more on, on advocating for software folks who live in software, uh, and then ultimately giving them the environment where they can succeed. Um, the, the big like point here is, so long as we as a DoD remain hardware-centric and industrial age, um, and so long as we think about it, the world that way, uh, we're missing out on opportunities to leverage in the incredible talents of unique individuals uh, in ways that ultimately will ensure that we can succeed as a country moving forward. Um, now there's some nuance behind that, and then Rebecca, if you wanna kinda get into that piece of it. So when you think of the world, when I look around, when I look in the room, if all of you were to stand up, which don't, unless you really want to, in which case, go for it, like I am going to predict that you all will be between five feet and six foot seven inches tall. Um, that's, I know that seems specific and it's just fine. But I, if, if someone stood up and they were nine feet tall, it would be shocking to literally everyone in the room and we would all notice and that person would answer questions literally every day of their entire lives about how tall are you and did you play basketball? Because that is so abnormal. So when you think of the physical world, you think of it in terms of this bell curve structure. And a lot of people who do talent management think of talent in the same way. So you're gonna have one or two people who suck, you're gonna have one or two people who are great, and you're gonna have 80 people who are just fine. And when you think about talent that way, it makes people very replaceable. Oh, you're gonna lose your software developer because you didn't give him a raise. He sounds like a diva. I have literally been told that our software developers were divas like a lot. Um, and, and it was true, but that's not the point. Like the point is like, you're gonna lose your diva yeah, I am, and it's going to destroy our mission. And that's very difficult to understand when you have this sort of hardware-centric bell curve mindset. What we discovered working at Shadow's Edge and, and honestly just working with some of the most brilliant people that exist is that technical talent does not align to the bell curve, where you have you know one person maybe can do a little bit better than the next, but you're not going to have that huge difference where you literally have some people who are two centimeters tall and other people who are 18 feet tall. Like, when it comes to talent, that is 100% how the distribution looks. Um, and when you think of the hardware-centric mindset, it makes it really easy to understand why that's not how the DOD thinks about it. So if I need to get a plane in the air, there are a handful of things I just need to have, a handful of people I need to have to get that plane in the air. I need the, the person who puts fuel in the plane. I don't actually care if they're hungover, if they can connect the thing to the thing and make sure that the fuel gets in the plane. I need the pilot to fly that plane. If it is the world's best pilot, that is fantastic, they can fly one plane. If it is the world's worst pilot, so long as they've met all of their crew training requirements, that is fantastic, they can fly one plane. And so it is a very numbers game. And in fact, like the organization and design of Air Force organizations are about how many people it takes to fly a plane. Literally, even the cyber organizations are still designed around the idea at the basic core of how many people does it take to put a plane in the air. Um, and when we're thinking about it that way, we are not thinking, in my estimation, about the type of talent that feels very differently um, about what it is that's in their environment that performs very differently if they show up hungover and that is completely unwilling to follow a checklist. Um, which gets us into like, why do hackers leave the DOD? Why did we have an 86% attrition rate? Um, for military folks. We actually did really good for civilians because I think we, we did, we controlled for some of these factors a little bit better. Um, but the number one cop out that I have heard that infuriates me every time I hear it now is that, oh, well, we really can't compete with the private sector, so meh, on pay. Specifically on pay, always on pay. Uh, and it's when it comes to why folks leave the DOD, it is almost never about the money. 
because they knew when they signed up that they wanted to work for the mission. They knew that it might not pay as well as some of the other jobs that they could pursue, and they came anyway. If they leave, do they get a pay raise most of the time? Absolutely, yes they do. And is that kind of nice? Sure, but that is literally not why they are leaving. And as long as we allow our senior leaders and ourselves to, to use that as a cop-out, we will never address the core problems. Um, Issue one. Issue two is, at least for our civilians, we actually got to a pretty decent set of like pay, especially at the entry level. We were paying entry level well enough that like I had one dude come and tell me, he's like, I just told my friend who took a job at some one of the like tech companies at, a, at the entry level right at college, I just told him what I'm making. And he was really surprised and he wants to come work here now because it would be a raise. And I was like, that's super cool. At the entry level, we do great. At the more senior levels, we do less great, but we still do pretty good. Like, especially if you live somewhere like San Antonio, Texas, you can live very comfortably on what we pay a purely technical, non-supervisory person. All of this to say, why do they leave if it's not about the money? And that requires us to analyze a little bit more about like what is in the, the DNA of the military. And I'm gonna do that around two phrases that have become so second nature to me that as I have transitioned outside of the government and occasionally use them, people are like, hold on, pause, what does that mean? Uh, the first one is queep. So if you have not heard the phrase queep, I tried to explain this to my husband and, and how he summarized it when I was done with a very long-winded explanation was, so wait, the Air Force in invented an entire word for meaningless paperwork. And the answer is yes, yes we did, and it is queep. Um, so that is one thing that I've found that software developers get really pissy about. If I'm like, hey, I get it, you're working on some code today, but I'm gonna need you to write down in this Excel spreadsheet exactly the security posture of that code using words that your community does not use. So uh, I'm gonna need that by about 5 p.m. or 1700 for you military folks, I'm gonna need that today. That's queep, and there is almost no tolerance for it among the highest performing technical talent. Uh, the second phrase that I have needed to explain to people, although it's much less explanation required, is shut up in color. <laughs> shut up in color means exactly what you think. Like, look, I know what you're saying might make sense, and maybe it's a better way to do things, but we really don't have time to change anything, so if you would just sit down with your crayons, please, and draw a nice picture, that would be great. Um, those are the things I think that best encapsulate for me, like the types of things that need to change in order for digital talent to be excited about a career in the DOD. And I think it's something that we did decently well. Um, we, we are imperfect. Um, I know that's shocking for some of you, but it's true. Um, I think it's something we did decently well, which, which explains both why our military folks stayed until they did have orders to leave, uh, and also why we only lost the civilians that we were hoping would leave, um, which I was very excited about. Um, and we didn't lose, for the most part, the civilians who we were hoping would stay. Um, we also had a lot of military folks come back as civilians, which again, I think speaks to like the culture of technical meritocracy that is hard to build, but really, really fun to work in if you are one of those 10X talent type people. Uh, and with that, what can you do to create an environment like that? Yeah. So the uh, one of the things uh, so especially sitting through this conference this week, uh, that, that has resonated well with me uh, when I reflect back on uh, Rebecca's and, and my time with the 90th, um, is, again, that incredible impact that individuals or small teams can have across the community, across the enterprise, uh, when, when you're bold, like curious to understand, and then bold in action. Um, so a few things that, that Rebecca and I worked, um, and again, I keep saying Rebecca and I, I have to caveat that with, like, there's obviously a lot of other people that had to do pieces of this to but get it But they done. are not on stage they're right not. now. Yeah, they're not. Um, so I'll keep saying Rebecca and I know that there was a whole cast of, of folks that were getting it done, but uh, we had the opportunity to brief uh, the Secretary of the Air Force uh, and the Chief of Staff of the Air Force um, not long after I had taken command. And, and Rebecca and I prepped for that discussion by considering what catastrophic success would look like as a result of that meeting. Um, and so we thought of things like, hey, there should be a software developer career field. Uh, hey, we should have in assignment incentive pay for our military folks that is tied to their proficiency, not to their rank. Hey, we should have cash awards for military. So if I have somebody in uniform that does something great that I can actually write them a check instead of just giving them a day off. Um, a whole bunch of things along those lines. And in addition to thinking through those things and having the willingness uh, to tell the Chief of Staff of the Air Force that we needed those things, we had also done the research to understand 
who all was involved, who needed to say yes, what the current process was, uh, each one of those elements, so that when the chief of staff said, all right, like, let's go do it, uh, we were ready to go execute as a team. Um, and now what we're starting to see through both uh, the NDAAs, uh, if there's any nerds in the crowd that like to read the NDAAs. Um, it's uh, the National Defense Authorization Act, which is the law that, the, the annual law that changes the things in the DOD that we want changed and sometimes changes the things that we liked how they sure. were also. It's a couple pages long. About like 15, 1500 or so. Yeah, it's a couple pages long. Um, so we started seeing changes there. Uh, we're seeing changes, if anybody saw, uh, the Secretary of the Air Force announced reoptimization, um, the stand-up of the Warrant Officer Corps, uh, which is specifically geared towards our enlisted members being able to remain technical, um, and then as well as the um, tech track for our Officer Corps. Uh, so we're starting to see some of these things get picked up and become institutionalized. Um, and then even uh, DFIDIC, uh, which is, I don't know what that one stands for. Don't, don't. Department of the Air Force IT, IT conference. conference, yeah. Um, uh, General Brown, when he briefed there, talked. He he told the story about like you know putting the folks in the basement, feeding them pizza, and just telling them to write code, um, and recognizing that as something that we as a service need to value. Um, that's a huge pivot, um, and and getting our senior leaders talking about that has been huge. Um, the uh, oh, and then and then the last part of that is the authorities piece of it, right? Like making sure that we understand the authorities who can say yes. There's a whole lot of people who will claim to say no, uh, but at the end of the day, there typically is only one person that actually has the authority to say yes and go do the thing. Um, making sure that we know who that person is um, and uh, knowing what their equities are, so that we can we can speak to those. And I think like when it comes to things like these pay raise for civilians, there's also the idea that a lot of the authorities that you want or need or, or think about, they literally already exist. And so one of the authorities I found when I got to Shadow's Edge that we had that we weren't using was direct hire authority, the ability to go outside of USA Jobs to hire people. It is completely doable. It was already authorized. It was already something we were allowed to use. And we just weren't because we didn't, we hadn't really figured out how to do it. Um, so we figured it out and it gave us a lot more authorities and, and let us make different hiring decisions than we would have necessarily been able to make through USA Jobs. With that, what should we do in the longer term? to fix this problem. Yeah, so the Foundation for Defense of Democracy released a, a report about a month ago now um, uh, advocating for uh, Congress to support a study, independent study on whether or not the Air Force, or whether or not uh, the DOD should have a separate force. <coughs> a separate cyber force. Uh, and, and that, what, what you might be thinking if you know a little bit about the government, but not a lot, is what I hear all the time, which is, wait, hold on, we already have Cybercom, like, y'all have everything you need. Um, there is some crazy dissertation level stuff I could talk about, about how the DOD is organized and why that doesn't actually count as a military force. Uh, but what I will say is it's Cybercom's job to employ the force that they are given. It's not their job to generate that force, to train that force, and to make the force that's like the best in the world. So if you look at the air, if you want to be the best pilot in the world and you are about to finish high school, like you should probably join the Air Force. That is where you will learn to be the best pilot in the world. That is why you would join the Air Force. There is nowhere when I'm, when I'm leaving high school thinking I would like to be the best hacker in the world, I do not think about going to the Department of Defense. I don't know if anybody does, I'd be very surprised. In my mind, a cyber force changes that almost immediately. If you are deliberately training and curating the best hackers in the world, all of the sudden, like all of the things that we talked about become ingrained in the baseline of your culture. And ultimately what it comes down to is what we value, right? So the Air Force, the Army, the Navy, each of those services have things that they value. Uh, that we have found in our experience are different from what we what we value as a developer community um, and as a tech community. And uh, one of the things that Rebecca and I um, achieved, I'd say, during our time at the 90th was creating a sanctuary for folks in government who want to do truly technical work. Um, my hope as we as we start to explore options like this uh, is that we can create a, a, basically that sanctuary at scale, right? So, so create that sanctuary for folks who want to do deep technical work in support of our national defense, and that we give them a, a home and a starting place to do that. And with that, I will say the one thing I wanted to mention that I forgot because I just talked about whatever I wanted instead, um, is that one of the things we actually found that our developers wanted to do was contribute to open source software. Um, so one of the big changes that we made that I was really proud of was having a written policy for open source software and when we could release tools in the 90th. Um, so if you're writing malware, we obviously don't want to release a ton of that open source for a lot of reasons that might actually be obvious. Like I'm actually very pro open source until I'm like, except for this exploit toolkit, I really don't want anyone else to have that we're gonna keep that one for ourselves. Um, but we have some tools 
Shadow's Edge has some tools uh, related to like malware analysis that are open source. They have some privatized like internet tunneling stuff that they've released open source. Um, and so that's something I think our developers were very proud of and proud to be able to contribute to the community. So with that, we don't have time for questions, but we are going to go stand in the hallway uh, if you would like to ask questions and uh, we will be around. So thank you guys very much.